Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we'll be talking a little bit about Gigglebit. It's g Gigabyte, is, we call them Gigglebit now. But we'll be talking about Gigabyte and their Giga Oops 7 Gigabyte data breach that has uh, AMD and Intel in NDA documents now available, including some information on Threadripper 5000 series CPUs coming up, or at least that's probably what they'll be called. We'll also be going over AMD's x86 market share increasing, covering uh, NVIDIA and ARM now facing a little bit more difficulty than previously thought, Noctua cooling kits getting updates for LGA 1700 free of charge for those who can prove a purchase previously, and we'll be going over a couple of other industry items. Before that, this video is brought to you by ASUS and the ASUS Tough Gaming B550 Plus Wi-Fi motherboard, ready for AMD Ryzen CPUs. The Tough Gaming B550 board comes in ATX and Micro ATX variants with key features, including a Wi-Fi 6 module, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, a fanless chipset heatsink for quiet operation, and a focus on stability and uptime. Learn more about the Tough Gaming B550 Plus Wi-Fi motherboard at the link in the description below. So the first real news item is about AMD Threadripper 5000, or whatever it ends up getting called. Uh, there's at least seven gigabytes currently of confidential documents that got leaked as a result of the recent gigabyte data breach from its servers. This aligned roughly with when we were working on the power supply content piece as well. So you may have seen a lot of discussion about Gigabyte in the last week, none of it particularly good for them. Uh, Gigabyte has been dealing with angry customers whose power supplies have turned their computers into DE dust to short A at this point. But at the same time, it's been handling relationships with Intel and AMD, who are probably not particularly happy about some of the leaks. Among the more interesting ones, WCCF Tech surfaced a legitimate document that shows uh, four infrastructure groups for the upcoming AMD thread per CPUs. And as we've shown in our past documents that we've retrieved from uh, probably about a year ago at this point, other leaks that were unrelated to this one, AMD lists its infrastructure group as a classification for certain CPUs for its partners to more easily design their products to mate with the CPU, whether uh, that's motherboard or a cooler, whatever it may be. In this particular leak, there's a lot of information on thermal. So this would be helpful to cooler designers uh, who actually do engineering on their products and, and don't just sort of rebrand stuff because it goes into details on thermal conductivity. As far as product level details, the current plan includes Threadripper STRX4 HEDT CPUs and SWRX8 CPUs. SWRX8, 8 meaning 8 channel for the memory, is the Pro line, and 4 would be 4 channel for the HEDT prosumer type line. The CPUs listed that we know of right now are 24, 32, and 64 cores for HEDT STRX 4 channel. And then for the Pro line, it's got some more variety, and there it goes from 12 to 16 to 24 to 32 to 64 cores. So you've got uh, an extra two options in at the lower end. As for the tables that have been uh, leaked or shown so far, these, they all look like legitimate AMD documents similar to actual AMD documents we've received in the past and it aligns with the leak from the hack. So this seems like one where you won't have to take a, a grain of salt with it. Uh, so the CPUs STRX4 are listed as 280 watt TDP. Again, TDP doesn't include power anywhere in the formula for AMD. And so the 280 watt TDP number means a different thing for SWRX8 than STRX4 even in this chart. Just to get everyone on the same page, TDP is derived from the formula TDP in watts equals T case degrees Celsius minus T ambient degrees Celsius divided by a uh, heatsink fan or HSF theta CA. So here we see T case is 60 on STRX4 and 75 on SWRX8 and that theta CA uh, also changes, or the thermal resistance also changes to 0.12. So the numbers are not like for like, they don't mean the same thing. Anyway, the leak also notes the dimensions of the CPUs and the Z height for them, including thermal conductivity of individual components of the CPU. This is the most interesting to us as it's rarely seen information in the public. The lid, for example, of the CPU, the IHS integrated heat spreader, is always pretty much nickel plated copper for both vendors at this point, and that's listed as 385 watts per meter Kelvin. This aligns with what we would expect of copper, but just seeing some more specificity for the product is interesting. We're assuming that this is at a standard 25 degrees Celsius for the thermal conductivity measurement. Thermal conductivity can be measured a number of ways. One of them is a machine that uh, basically sends a pulse through the interface and then measures uh, the return, and from that they can take a produce a number for thermal conductivity, but 
you have to know the temperature you're conducting it at. Most companies will choose something like 25 degrees Celsius for a somewhat standard measurement. So anyway, that's what we have for the, the thermal conductivity numbers for the lid. The specs also go into detail on the core die TIM, or the interface between the CCD and the lid. So this is new information for us, at least. That's 62 watts per meter Kelvin. The die itself is about 118 watts per meter Kelvin. And the flip chip bumps and the LGA pins are the lowest thermal conductivity listed. Considering most of the heat goes into the lid to be gotten rid of out of the CPU and not through the socket, all this makes sense. There's also a substrate between the dyes and LGA to get through as well. This information isn't necessarily extremely useful to a consumer. It's very interesting though, and at GN we'll be able to use this to better inform our cooler reviews and better understand sort of where the, you might call them weak spots or bottlenecks, so to speak, are in the pipeline for getting the heat away from the actual dyes. So pretty cool stuff, uh, mostly useful from more of an understanding the engineering standpoint of things than actually product level knowledge, but uh, not something we commonly see. This is typically information that is produced and shared with cooler partners and motherboard partners, but cooler partners can make use of it, especially the sizing information. They need all of that in order to engineer the bracket and the mounting hardware, the cold plate size, all that stuff. And then motherboard vendors need it for uh, figuring out what they're going to be working with as well, especially if they need to consider any sort of uh, heat sinking near or at the back of the socket. In this case, it's pretty standard. There's no official release date that's been exposed yet. It might be in that list of documents that's been leaked. It probably is. At the time of filming, though, we haven't seen anything get produced. Uh, we would assume by end of year for Threader for 5,000, though, just because the amount of information that's coming out at this point seems to align with that target date. Up next, also related to AMD, but this is an official report from Mercury Research. The latest batch of data from Mercury from quarter two of 2021 via Tom's hardware reporting, has AMD closing in on a 14 year high for x86 CPU market share. This is despite the fact that AMD, like everyone else, is constrained by the supplier, TSMC, for its ability to produce CPUs. Per Mercury research, AMD notched a 22.5% share of the total x86 market, that's everything. And that's a number that it hasn't hit since 2007 during its Athlon and Opteron heydays. AMD's x86 market share peaked back in 2006 when it accounted for about 25.3% of the CPU market. Breaking things down by segment, AMD actually lost 2.3 percentage points in desktop market, and that moved the company down to 17.1% of the market. Although, as CPU makers tend to do when the market becomes supply limited, AMD has been prioritizing SKUs with higher margins. That likely accounts for the slight decline in market share in desktop and the slight increase in server. Offsetting that loss, however, is the fact that AMD has gained also in the notebook segment, including consumer, gaining 1.9 percentage points to bring it up to 20% of the market. As for the server gain, Mercury has AMD gaining a very slight but still meaningful 0.6 percentage points. This brings its share up to 9.5%. And as usual, Mercury Research captures data of all x86 class servers, and that's regardless of the socket count. So some of the other research firms and AMD only account for the one processor and two processor configurations in server, whereas Mercury is accounting for everything. That might be uh, four CPUs or whatever you might be scaling up to. So the difference in measurement obviously makes for some difference in numbers. Some of the firms have AMD closer to 15%, but they're cutting out part of the actual server market just because AMD doesn't specifically compete there. It doesn't mean the market doesn't exist there though. So it's not, maybe not fair to cut it out. Uh, still a gain overall for AMD in market share over the past year. Noctua was cooler mounting kits available in October for LGA 1700. So this is, it's kind of cool. Uh, some of the cooler manufacturers are working on making upgrade kits available for free for existing coolers on the market. That's the right thing to do for a number of reasons. Coolers are fairly expensive for what they are. Metal's expensive, obviously, but uh, it's a cooler. It's a very competitive market. You have to do something to differentiate yourself and providing free upgrade kits is a great way to do it because it shows a certain level of customer service that you might not get from a bottom of the barrel cooler. Noctua is offering LGA 1700 upgrade kits for coolers that currently support existing LGA 11 5X standards. And that would be so that they can support Alder Lake, which is coming out initially later this year, and then there'll be more Alder Lake next year. The company announced its NM-I7XX MP83. 
and NM-i7XX, the XX being whatever the uh, model is, MP78 SecuFirm 2 mounting kits, which will allow customers with current Noctua CPU coolers to upgrade to Intel's Alder Lake S CPUs without having to purchase new coolers. The updated mounting kits address Noctua coolers that use either 78mm or 83mm pitch mounts, and Noctua notes that no pre-assembly or adjustment is required. Seeing as coolers are, again, just metal, it's sometimes engineered in great ways, but it's ultimately metal. It doesn't really go bad. It doesn't have much of an expiration date. It's good to see that there's an effort to bring them forward rather than just go, this is a convenient time to make these obsolete so that no one can ever use the copper or aluminum again unless they're recycled. Let's force people to buy new ones. So uh, good to see. Now, obviously, there are some concerns when you bring coolers forward generationally. As the CPU changes, the location of hotspots might change. It may or may not matter. It depends on the CPU. Uh, but maybe more specifically, the IHS may change. And so if the package height changes, the company will have to account for that as it redesigns its mounting kit. And it might not be possible to make certain coolers work with certain CPUs in the future. Additionally, the die, uh, well, the IHS size means that the cold plate size may need to be updated. So for example, even if you can adapt forward Asetek coolers for AMD Threadripper CPUs, unless they're Asetek Threadripper coolers, you really shouldn't be doing that because it barely covers the dies, and it certainly doesn't cover the IHS, not anywhere close to coverage of the IHS. And that means much higher temperatures, even if it's an area that doesn't technically have silicon under it, because it's all still a useful area. It's just copper. It helps to connect them. So uh, users looking to claim the free mounting kit will need to provide Nocto with proof of purchase. You might be able to just send them a photo of the cooler. That might be enough for them. And that would be for both an eligible knock to a cooler, and you'd also have to prove that you have an LGA 1700 capable motherboard. Uh, additionally, the kits will be available as separate purchases beginning mid-October for a price of about $8. So if you can't, if you don't have an LGA 1700 board, you can still buy the kit. Noctua's CEO said this of the update, quote, using a CPU cooler across several platform generations instead of buying a new heatsink for each generation is not only economical, it also helps to reduce unnecessary waste and save precious resources. Noctua's CEO continued saying, by upgrading rather than replacing your cooler, you're actively contributing to a more sustainable PC industry. This is an excellent stance and maybe describes why Noctua isn't in the position of Corsair in the market, but why it is generally more respected. Uh, Asus cooler is among the first to support Intel's LGA 1700 socket as well. So Asus has a couple of coolers, not too many, but they're mostly Asetek based. Asetek is a supplier, much like say Cooler Master, which has been sued by Asetek several times for making coolers because it doesn't like competition. But Asus's ROG Strix 2 coolers, which are Asetek based, will support LGA 1700. Those mounting kits uh, will support 75 by 75 millimeter and 78 by 78 millimeter hole spacing. And the adjustment here may or may not have something to do with Intel's future plans for an LGA 1700 Raptor Lake. So uh, these kits, all of them, should have support potentially for another, not necessarily socket, but another CPU revision after uh, the initial Alder Lake launch, which is typically what Intel does. It maps out the motherboard and mounting hole spacing for normally a couple generations at a time and gives the cooler manufacturers a heads up. Uh, up next, NVIDIA says the ARM takeover might slow down a bit, finally. So NVIDIA is coming around to the idea that maybe it's not so easy to force a $40 billion acquisition of a major contributor in the market through all the global regulatory systems. And now that it has learned that, uh, it's, it's preparing to slow down. Or more appropriately, NVIDIA is preparing its investors. Uh, ahead of a potential slowdown in the acquisition if it is to go through. NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huan was the one who moved from an overly optimistic stance previously to a more reserved one, saying, quote, our discussions with regulators are taking longer than initially thought, so that's pushing out the timetable. Huan also said that there's not one particular delay, just that it was regulation in general. Additionally, NVIDIA CEO told the Financial Times that, quote, we are confident in the deal, we're confident regulators should recognize the benefits of the acquisition. At this point, NVIDIA has faced challenges in, uh, particularly in the UK, for getting approval where some of the concerns listed by some of the UK's government agencies 
included national security concerns regarding ARM being acquired by NVIDIA. And uh, as you would expect, it's also having trouble elsewhere in the world because regulations and governments uh, are, are not particularly fast moving with something as complex as a $40 billion acquisition from one of the world's largest silicon designers uh, to one of the world's largest licensing firms for other silicon products. This, this is something that should probably take some time because it has dramatic implications for the industry as a whole. Also, it, it starts to potentially box out certain competitors depending on how it's all handled. And that leads to the next story. So according to a report from Reuters, Global Foundries has uh, apparently confidentially filed an IPO with regulators in the state of New York that could value the company at $25 billion. Global Foundries, if you are a bit newer to this industry, you might not know the impact it has had in the past. So Global Foundries was originally spun out from AMD. AMD went fabulous, meaning it got rid of its fabrication plants. They're very expensive to build and to maintain. Intel has shown us all that it's hard to do both design and fabrication both quickly and competently uh, rather than just focusing on one, although there are benefits to having everything in-house. So AMD spun it out, and that was to help with cash flow back at the time it did it. Global Foundries ended up being the primary choice for AMD for a number of years, including for early Zen CPUs. Global Foundries was uh, the fabricator of choice for those before TSMC took over when Global Foundries couldn't get to seven nanometer fast enough. So the company has been significant, but AMD doesn't work with it as much anymore. It still does work with it though. Most recently, there have been rumors of a potential purchase of Global Foundries by Intel, but the report of a potential IPO casts some doubt on any such deal materializing. Reuters says its sources point out that such a merger would face intense scrutiny from regulators and would also threaten Global Foundries at deep partnership with Intel's competitors, namely again, AMD, which basically created it. Strategically, if Intel bought Global Foundries and NVIDIA is able to buy ARM successfully. It does put AMD in an extremely difficult position uh, because it, it now its key competitors own two of the major IP firms. AMD works with ARM, as do most companies, and Foundries, Global Foundries in this case, if Intel were to buy it. So Global Foundries is looking at a potential IPO. It looks like that would be announced in October of this year and would go public by the end of the year or early next year, if that happens. Uh, it also recently announced that company-wide rebranding, which we talked about before, not super exciting there. Uh, but in addition to that, it talked about doubling the capacity of one of its existing fabs, which is known as Fab 8. So Global Foundry is in the news a lot lately and trying to make some progress. Up next, this one's just kind of interesting. AMD's, what we thought was retired, RX 570 has made something of a comeback. Uh, this is in the form of a Sapphire PCB. Sapphire has pulled the RX 570 out of the grave and is putting two of them on a board to make a dual RX 570 card. This isn't a thing that existed officially. It was never an AMD product officially, but uh, it's getting made and added from what we can tell from reports online so far to Sapphire's mining line of GPUs. Now this unfortunately means that it's Pretty unlikely this will be able to be used for gaming. We'd love to test it in gaming. It's uh, the 500 series had Crossfire officially supported, so you could do something with it. And you could theoretically run four GPUs and two PCBs like you could do in the days of yore with dual GPU PCBs. But unless there's a vBIOS that comes out that officially adapts and supports this for non-mining applications, it's unlikely we'll ever see it usable for anything outside of mining. The board has a single HDMI port on it. Otherwise, it's pretty basic. There's a heat sink that covers both of the dies, obviously, and a couple of fans, and that's about it. It's a very simple board, simple card, and uh, the branding is completely absent other than some Sapphire branding on the chokes. Uh, and that, we think, is just because, obviously, they're trying to not spend a lot of money on the cooler since mining operations don't really care about how how many racing stripes are on the design. You can tell it's clearly two GPUs though because the there's no shot of the actual PCB with the cooler removed, unfortunately, but the shot of the back of it shows the two sets of four retention screws for the cooler, and you can see the back side of the GPUs where the caps are all present. So pretty clearly dual GPU card. Interesting, would be fun to test, but unlikely to work in anything sort of normal uh, for normal use cases. 
Up next, NVIDIA has a GPU coming out. This one, an official launch. This is the RTX A2000. It's a, a very low-end card in the Ampere line. It's supposed to be low profile as, as well, although that's a bit limited, and it's dedicated for workstations. NVIDIA's A2000 is its first low profile RTX card and its first mid-range RTX card for professional use, mid-range here being extremely relative to the industry that it's in. As we saw with the gaming GPUs, as in the previous generation, you stepped down the ladder to say the GTX 16 series, even though it's sort of in the same generation in terms of the timeline, uh, the RTX support would get cut. And that was true for workstations too, where the further down you got in cost, for the previous generation, the more features were removed and RT was one of those. In this instance though, A2000 does keep RT capabilities. It's stripped down as is everything else by nature of being a lower end device, but it still has RT acceleration and hardware. The RTX A2000 will be based on NVIDIA's GA106 silicon. And this has been cut down in terms of SMs and clock speed, with the latter topping out at a boost speed of 1200 megahertz. NVIDIA also trimmed back VRAM in the A2000, cutting down to six gigabytes instead of 12, but still using GDDR6, and it has partial ECC memory support. NVIDIA lists a 70 watt TDP for the A2000, and despite being billed and marketed as low profile, it's still a two slot card. So it's not a tall PCB, but you don't get some of the advantages you used to get with the lower end uh, quadro type devices where it's a single slot device. Uh, this won't fit in the smallest machines. You won't be able to stack quite as many of them, but it's relatively small as far as Ampere goes anyway. And uh, this, by the way, shouldn't be confused with the other RTX A2000 that already exists. That's a laptop SKU uh, and it's a bit different. Now, Nvidia expects the card to be available in October and the MSRP, $450. Like most cards of this class in the now A series, or previous Quadro series, that's that's rough to pay for unless you really know you need it. Uh, normally, you can start getting gaming GPUs and do some of the same stuff for a little bit cheaper, but technically, you're, uh, by the EULA, not allowed to do certain things with the Quadros. So uh, it's a market that they could still tap into. There's certain driver level stuff that's beneficial as well. You can't get that on the gaming line. People will buy it, but 450 is a bit steep for what you're going to get for it. For 70 watt TDP, can't do a whole lot with that. Skyrim is apparently immortal. It's getting another anniversary port. The last one was uh, for the five year anniversary, 2016. This one's for the 10 year anniversary being 2021. In the news for the past week or so, Bethesda's Todd Howard noted that he demands more Skyrim from his team and the, the Skyrim ports will continue until morale improves at this point. This coincides with QuakeCon 2021 and again, the 10 year anniversary, which will be November 11th for this year. That's, uh, it originally came out 2011, 11, 11. So now this anniversary edition will include the previous special edition of the game. That one was optimized for Xbox One and PS4 and featured high resolution textures and assets. It'll also include the core post-release content. So that'd be Dawnguard, Hearthfire, and Dragonborn. In addition to official add-ons from Bethesda, the anniversary edition will also ship with 500 pieces of content from the Creation Club. This is Bethesda's community of both internal and external developers working on Skyrim and Fallout 4 content um, because Bethesda, Bethesda is finally embracing the fact that it can't ship a game that works with any level of reasonable quality out of the box uh, and so it relies on its community to build a good game. But as long as they keep supporting mods, we're all for it. Uh, a lot of us here have had a lot of hours and Skyrim, Morrowind, and the other games, thanks to the mod support. So anyway, they're shipping 500 mods with uh, the Anniversary Edition. There will also be a new mechanic added. It's really exciting, it's fishing. So there'll be a new fishing mechanic, uh, and Bethesda says that there will also be a proper next-gen update for Xbox Series X and S and the PS5, although some of the specifics on that haven't been disclosed at this point. We also don't know, technically, uh, if this is coming to PC or not, but almost certainly it will be. It's a pretty safe bet because Skyrim's a money machine, so why wouldn't they do it? If you already bought the special edition previously, then you'll get the anniversary edition, that would be the 10 year, the 2021 one, free as an upgrade. And if you have managed to not play Skyrim at all in 10 years, then now is a decent time to get started. We were also able to exclusively confirm one additional detail. You won't hear this anywhere else. Uh, Todd Howard is actually planning a Skyrim coffin edition. This is where they'll sell special coffins. So 
uh, in it's releasing in 2049, and basically they'll install a screen. You can play Skyrim when you're dead. So that's the next advancement for Skyrim. We look forward to reviewing it. Well, I don't know if we'll be able to produce a review, but we'll be getting them. Adobe, apparently not big enough. It announces a Frame.io acquisition. This initially wasn't that interesting to us, but as we read into the story, uh, if you use any Adobe or video editing software, there's some interesting stuff here. Premiere is the main Adobe product for video production. There's also After Effects, for effects, as you would expect. And the competition to this would be DaVinci Resolve, competing with Adobe Premiere Pro, and Final Cut from Apple's camp, also competing with Premiere Pro. The one thing that Premiere Pro lacks, aside from working reliably and a lot of other things, is cloud support. And that's what Frame.io is adding. So this is supposed to be a $1.275 billion purchase from Adobe. According to Bloomberg, Adobe had been working on its own collaborative software implementation previously, but moved to buy Frame.io as many customers were already using it. Frame.io has collaborative support for Premiere Pro, After Effects, and is working on integrations with other video editing suites, including existing integrations with Apple's Final Cut Pro and Avid's Media Composer. Frame.io's claim to fame is the cloud-based workload, which centralizes assets and projects and allows for feedback, comments, annotations, and uh, other sort of Google Drive or workspace type offerings for collaborative editing. Adobe expects the acquisition to be complete in fourth quarter. It's basically a way of trying to get a better multi-person editing of a project under its roof. This is something, if you do any video editing, then you're aware of how lacking Adobe is in this area. So potentially interesting, maybe something we'll use. A lot of our stuff is a single person project, but there's there, there have been times where we've had two versions of a project and then merged them later if we have certain edits that need to be done uh, in tandem. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, you can subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. And we'll see you all next time.